Welcome to the Joy of Music. Today we want to share with you excerpts from a very special presentation, The Man from Aldersgate, which is the story of John Wesley, one of the great champions of Christianity and the founder of the Methodist Church. The life of John Wesley is portrayed today on the Joy of Music by Roger Nelson a professional actor who has done over 350 performances of the life of this great Christian leader. You will also be hearing music of the Wesleys, Charles and Samuel. And now, The Man from Aldersgate with Roger Nelson. Uh, oh, yes, little one. No, no. Let the child speak, please. I'm sorry, young lady. Say it one more time, but just a little bit louder for an old man whose ears have had to bear the noise of loud adults for too long. Yes? Oh, the fire. You heard about the fire. When I was five and a half, just about your age, I'd imagine, I lived with my mother and father and uh, six sisters and a brother in a large thatched roof house behind the church my father preached in. Now, my father was a very fine preacher and very outspoken. This one time, the toes he stepped on were those of a local group of heretics known as the dissenters. From the pulpit, he spoke out against them for rejecting the forms and doctrines of the established church. And they decided to make him sweat for it. And since they were afraid to face my father by day, they came by night to do their evil. They destroyed our crops, broke the legs of our cattle and pigs, and even hamstrung our poor horses. But this was not enough to silence my father. So the devil drove them to even attempt to set fire to the house where we all slept. It was midnight, midwinter, on the 9th of February, 1709. Suddenly, Father was awakened from a deep sleep by shouts of fire from the street below. He rushed to the bedroom door and to his horror found the house full of smoke. Quickly, Father directed my mother and my two younger sisters who were sleeping with her to flee for their lives. 
Mother burst into the nursery, hurriedly scooped up one of us, and told the others to follow her holding hands with the next in a human lifeline through the dense smoke. But the chain had a weak link somewhere, and in the confusion, I was left behind. Remember how strange my room looked to me, all ablaze like a bright burning nightmare swirling all around me. Well, in panic, I, I ran in the nursery and climbed upon the chest in front of the windowsill. In the garden below, men, women, children, and howling animals scurried about in terror. I tried to shout to them above the crackling flames, Mother, Father, here I am, help me! But the noise was too great, and my little voice was too small. Then someone saw my silhouette against the flames, but nobody seemed to know what to do. The roof was a mass of flames above my head, and there was no time to find a ladder. Then suddenly one man came running toward the house and calling to the others. He braced himself against the wall below, while another man climbed upon his back until he was standing on his broad shoulders. Then the top man reached upward, stretching as hard as he could to reach me. Thanks to God, the man's arms were just long enough to snatch me out of the window. And no sooner was I safe in his arms than the roof above the entire house, nursery and all, caved in with a tremendous crash of sparks and smoke. I clung to the stranger, crying and shaking uncontrollably. When he tried to release me into the arms of another man, I resisted until I saw that the other man was my father. Father was crying too. And I was afraid he would crush my small body in his great arms as he hugged me. Then he said, Come, neighbors, let us kneel down. Let us give thanks to God. From that time on, my mother impressed upon me that such a deliverance could only mean that God must have some great destiny in store for me. From that time on, she took the greatest care to prepare me for that destiny, for that special work God had for her Jackie. And I felt God's calling as strongly as my mother did. Since that day, I have always felt like a brand plucked from the fire, a sword tempered by the flames and forged for the Lord to wield in his mighty right hand. And since that day, I have prepared to be used to cut men's souls to the quick. Praise the Lord of all. 
soldiers of Christ arise and put your armor on. Strong in the strength which God supplies to his eternal son. Strong in the Lord of hosts and in his mighty power. First, 1738, we landed at Deal, England. A week later, I chanced, by God's providence, to meet that same Peter Berler just returned from Germany. Well, from that moment on, I wasted not one opportunity to converse with him on the grievous matter of my spiritual state. Yet, my very nature resisted his witness. You see, I had been the instructor of debate at Oxford, and when Brother Burler spoke of faith, I countered with my ever-drawn sword of argument. But how, Peter? How can I really know that I am saved? By faith alone? But what of works? But I have always sought to become a Christian through my good works. At Oxford, we of the Holy Club ministered to the poor, the sick, the widowed, the fatherless, to those in prison, and they are not enough. But what more can one do or be asked to do? Trust in Jesus Christ alone. But, but, but I have always held that to become a Christian, one must proceed through an orderly and logical course of good deeds, growing in grace as the years progressed until finally, upon completing his life service, God may or may not declare him saved and a Christian. And you stand here and tell me that I can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I am saved here and now. How? How, Peter? How can I know for certain that I am saved in this life? By trusting in Jesus Christ alone. That's all. That's everything. No, but it's too simple, Peter. You see, I have always followed every argument to its logical conclusion. How am I now to suddenly pad such a lifetime of orderly discipline in order to accept an assurance of salvation founded on faith in, in Jesus Christ alone? Where is the proof of my salvation, the rock I am to base my assurance on? The rock of Jesus Christ, the, the Scriptures. Peter, show me the Scriptures. Romans 5.1. Yes, yes, I know it. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2. 8 and 9. Uh, for by grace you have been saved through faith, 
and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, that no... For by grace you have been saved to faith and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not as a result of works, that no man should boast. What? Acts 16, 31. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Yes? Yes, Peter. I think I am beginning to understand. I was now nearly convinced of my unbelief. For three agonizing months I tried to argue with Peter Burler argue myself out of my own salvation. Thank God I'd failed at that too. Jesus, my blood and righteousness, my beauty and my glorious dress, several weeks, my soul had been rent and ravaged by the truth. Now I too was ready to follow wherever the Holy Spirit would take me. He took me to Aldersgate Street. I awoke at five o'clock the morning of May 24th, 1738, and found these words confronting me in the New Testament. 
whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. I closed my Bible to meditate on the words, partakers of the divine nature. Then I opened it again, and this time another verse seemed to virtually leap out at me. Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. All the rest of that morning, these two promises filled my mind. In the afternoon, I went to the services held at the vast St. Paul's Cathedral. All the ritual was familiar enough, but yet somehow it all had new meaning for me. Surely I thought, this, this is a most fitting place in which God could reveal himself to me. But it was not the place of God's choosing. I, I did not know just where I wanted to go that evening, but I knew it was not to another religious meeting. So I just walked. Eventually, I unwillingly found myself at a meeting on Aldersgate Street where one was reading Martin Luther's preface to the Epistle to the Romans. About a quarter to nine, while Luther's commentary was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warm. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation, and an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. Well, I began to pray with all my might for those who had in particular despitefully used and persecuted me. Then I testified openly what I felt in my heart. such an experience, this new birth in Jesus Christ? Is it like being born again? Who can say? For who can recall the events of their first birth? Perhaps 
It is like being an ugly, wrinkled caterpillar, wallowing in the dust all of your life, then suddenly becoming a beautiful, free-floating butterfly, a creature of the wind, nectar-fed and free. Now, I actually felt a presence. His presence living and striving not only with me, but within me. I was no longer alone. And herein I found the difference between this and my former state. Then I was sometimes, if not often, conquered. Now I was always conqueror. My first thought was to rush and tell the good news to my ailing brother. Some of those who had been at the Aldersgate meeting came along and in a moment, my brother's sick room was transformed into a sanctuary of joy. As we knelt before his bed, Charles led us in singing the hymn he had written only the day before. Where shall my wandering soul begin? How shall I all to heaven aspire? A slave redeemed from death and sin, a brand plucked from eternal fire. And for the second time in my life, I was again a brand plucked from the fire, but this time from the eternal fire of hell and damnation. Praise be to God. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing My great Redeemer's praise The glories of my God and King The triumphs of His grace Jesus, the name that charms our fears That bids our sorrow cease Tis music in the sinner's ears Tis life and health and peace He breaks the power of cancelled sin He sets the prisoner free Yeah. 